officials, one for blacks, one for whites, to take the oath. There were separate phone booths, elevators, stairways. The races were separate, all right, but they were hardly equal. Our series, The Fifties, continues with the racial upheavals that beset America on its journey toward greater justice. Our program includes personal remembrances from a reporter who was in the trenches during the Civil Rights Wars, my former colleague at NBC, John Chancellor, who died soon after his interview was conducted. Join us now as the History Channel presents The Fifties, The Rage Within. What do you mean, go get it? Man, that ball's way in left field. I don't care what field is in. Willie play it all field. Say hey, say who, say Willie. Say hey, say who. In 1954, Willie Mays hit 41 home runs. The following year, he hit 50. He runs the bases like a choo-choo train. Swings around the back like an aeroplane. His cap flies off when he passes through. And he heads home. In the 1950s, Willie Mays was the most spectacular player in baseball. Once the color barrier in baseball had been broken, Mays was visible proof of what talented black athletes could do if given the chance. But in parts of the country, this all-star baseball player was less than a second-class citizen. In southern states, whites beat and murdered blacks without fear of retribution. At the same time, athletes, entertainers, and musicians were changing the very character of American culture. These cruel contradictions would spark a smoldering rage. The time had come for America to examine the color of its soul. Remember the 1950s through images, movies, advertisements, and newsreels. In these technicolor memories, the characters are all white. The 15 million blacks then living in the United States almost never appear. I am an invisible man. No, I'm not a spook like those who haunted Edgar Allan Poe. No, am I one of your Hollywood movie ectoplasms? I am a man of substance, of flesh and bone, fiber and liquids. And I might even be said to possess a mind. I'm invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. In 1952, the book Invisible Man created an immediate sensation. Written by a young man named Ralph Ellison, the novel set the problem of race at the heart of the American character. It wasn't a black problem, it wasn't a white problem. It was an all-American problem. A problem of vision. We were much more, as African Americans, invisible in the 50s than it's possible to imagine now. It's so easy to turn on the television and find somebody black on every channel and heard, turn on the radio and hear so many black Americans. In those days, it really was an event when somebody black appeared in the media. And so we have to readjust our sights and really think, where do we look to find the invisible ones? So invisible were blacks that American whites simply did not see one of the largest and most rapid internal migrations in history.
Starting in the beginning of the century and accelerating in the 40s and 50s, over six million African Americans would leave the southern states to settle in the great cities of the North and West, particularly Chicago. Many were fleeing the injustice in the South. Many left because the picking jobs in the southern cotton fields were replaced by machines. In the North, the great factories and mills were desperate for workers, no matter what their color. Cities like Chicago offered one thing the South could not, good jobs. Chicago was, in fact, the promised land. It was beyond the land of hope. The dreams became realized. Don't mean a thing if you ain't got that swing. There were plenty of clubs, jazz clubs. Got to know Louis Armstrong and Bella Fitzgerald and Billy Holiday just standing on the corner. So it was a world within a world. Just give that rhythm every little thing you've got. If you ain't got that thing. Chicago was a world apart from the life that African Americans had left behind in the South. These two worlds were about to collide. In the summer of 1955, a 14-year-old boy from Chicago named Emmett Till decided to take a trip down south to Mississippi. He traveled with a cousin, Wheeler Parker, who had grown up in the South, and knew the danger of not obeying the laws of segregation. If you lived there, it, it was like entrenched in you, the rules. But if you didn't, you could break them without knowing that you were breaking them. In Mississippi, Emmett Till and Wheeler Parker went to stay with Parker's grandfather, a sharecropper named Mose Wright. My grandfather was a unique man. He was, uh, he was like the head of his house, you know. When he spoke, everybody listened. He was the man, so to speak. Once we arrived in, in the South by car, we went to my grandfather's house, which is in Money, Mississippi. So we had a lot of fun, you know. You fish, you hunt, and you eat, and you sit out on, you know, by the wood pile telling jokes. You know, Emmett loved jokes, loved jokes. So he would pay people to tell jokes. Only time you would go to town is like the weekends, like we did. The town of money was dirt poor. But for Emmett Till and Wheeler Parker, it was a place to go. The only store in town was Bryant's Grocery. Today, the store is a ramshackle monument to a brief moment shared by two people on a hot August day. Emmett Till and the wife of the store owner, Carolyn Bryant. Known as a local beauty, a crossroads Marilyn Monroe, Carolyn Bryant was alone in the store that day when Emmett Till walked in. What happened next is a mystery. According to Bryant, Till flirted with her, saying, don't be afraid of me, baby. I've been with white girls before. Emmett may have said something or just whistled at Bryant. Whatever happened, a line was crossed that was invisible to the 14-year-old boy from Chicago. When Carol and Bryant ran to get a gun, the boys quickly left in their truck. Emmett begged us, he said, don't tell, I call him Papa, my grandfather, Moe's right, don't, I don't want you to tell him. So we decided we wouldn't tell him. And there was a girl that she said, you're going to hear some more from this. This is not over. I know those people. They're those kind of people, you know. She said, you're going to hear some more. Brian heard from his wife what had happened, and he called his half-brother, J.W. Milan, who really was a huge, physically imposing, bullying man, and told him a black boy had been fresh with his uh, wife, which was an affront to all white manhood in the Mississippi of 1955, and he said, I'll come over right now. Sunday morning, about 2.30, someone called at the door. And I said, who is it? And he said, this is Mr. Bryant. 
I want to talk with you and the boys. And when I opened the door, there was a man standing with a pistol in, in one hand and a flashlight in the other hand. I can't remember if I heard the knock, but I do remember them now talking to my grandfather. And they say, you got two boys here from Chicago and we want to see the one that did the talk at the store. In my mind, I said, I'm gonna die. I think the whole bed probably was shaking, you know. And Emmett just wasn't afraid. He didn't know the danger he was in. And he wanted to put his socks on. They started cursing him, you know. And he was saying, yeah. I said, no, and they didn't like that. You don't say, yeah, yeah, no, to white people in the South. It was, yes, sir, or, no, sir, no, ma'am, yes, ma'am, you know, at that time. And then marched him to the car, and they asked someone there, was this is the right boy? And the answer was, here. And they drove toward money. That was the last time anyone saw Emmett Till alive. A few days later, a boy fishing found Till's body in the Tallahatchie River, snagged on a root. A 75-pound cotton gin fan was tied to his neck with barbed wire. His face and body were badly mutilated, but he was identified by the ring on his finger. Emmett Till's mother managed to have the body brought back to Chicago. When I went to see Emmett, every bone in my body turned to steel. And as I began to identify pieces and bits of him, such as the few remaining teeth, such as the ear, where half of it was missing, and the one eye that was left, one was gone, and the one that was left, I could tell that that was Emmett's eye because I knew the color. And Mr. Rayner wanted to know, did I want him to retouch the body if I wanted him to fix it? And I told him, no, you can't fix that. I said, let the world, I want the world to see what I have seen. To show the world what had happened, Emmett's mother displayed her son's body in an open casket. The news of the murder of Emmett Till was shocking and frightening. I think there was a feeling among most people in the black community, it's important to remember now, we're just one generation, even myself, removed from the South. There was a feeling that this could happen to a relative of any one of us. Jet Magazine ran pictures of Emmett Till's disfigured corpse, something that helped to make the Till case a national story. It's my opinion that the guilt begins with Mrs. Bryant. And I want to see Mrs. Bryant punished, her husband, and any other persons that were in on this thing. And I feel like the pressure should start from the President of the United States and be channeled all the way down to the township of Money, Mississippi. The spotlight now shifted to Mississippi. For the first time, Southern racism was a national story, as reporters from all over the world streamed into the little town of Sumner, Mississippi. In fact, I remember the bus didn't actually go to Sumner. It dropped you off on the road, uh, and you had to walk into the little town, and there was a big sign that said, Sumner, Mississippi, uh, a good place to raise a boy. Sumner, a good place to raise a boy. I remember it very well. Just out of college, an aspiring writer named David Halberstam managed to get an assignment to cover the Till trial. The reporters 
who had come down from the north were told not to hang around in Sumner at night because otherwise they were going to get picked up and possibly killed and would disappear. It was that explosive. You could just almost feel as you walked down the street that people wanted to jostle you and beat you up. I mean, you could feel the hatred etched on the faces of the local whites towards anyone who was different. You were their enemy. This was not Americans from different states together in a courthouse. This was us and them. This was a foreign land. We never have any trouble until some of our southern niggas go up north and the NAACP talks to them and they come back home. Clarence Strider, H.C. Strider, who was the sheriff, huge man. The word nigger seemed to come from his mouth in every other word. A plantation owner, Strider was furious to learn that he would have to seat black reporters in the courtroom. He squeezed them all in around one small table, jagged with splinters. Strider also put Till's mother there, along with a man who came to monitor the fairness of the trial, Charles Diggs, a congressman from Detroit. Those few white people that um, I was exposed to were surprised, even shocked, you know, that there was such a thing as a black member of Congress. They don't know anything about anything like that. One of the deputy sheriffs said, there's a nigger congressman there that says he has a right to have a seat here. And I said, what? A nigger congressman? I mean, it was just astonishing to them. I mean, it was as if their world was being turned upside down. The trial started on August 18th. Though 63% of Tallahatchie County was black, every juror was white. According to Mississippi custom, jury service was restricted to white males over the age of 21. I remember their contempt for the process. I remember them sort of smirking and winking and sitting out on the front steps as if it were a picnic, giving ice cream cones to their children. I mean, they were enjoying it. It was their largest moment. There was no fear of conviction. The mother of the victim couldn't help but notice the love between parents and children that passed between the family of the accused. Each of them had a little boy on each knee. They both had two sons. And their mother, coming behind them, wiping their brows with a cloth, giving them something to drink, fanning them, leaning over to ask them if they were comfortable. The case for the prosecution was solid. Every detail of the murder, including the gin fan, was presented in court. The man who collected much of the evidence was a fearless NAACP representative named Medgar Evers. The key witness was Mose Wright, who had been hiding out since the night of the murder. When he appeared in Sumner, he was fully aware of the danger of what he was about to do. I remember his tremendous dignity of Mose Wright and, and the tremendous, you know, he stood ramrod straight and he pointed at those men. And it was an unforgettable moment. You knew it was a historical moment because you knew nobody in his position had ever done that before. When the defense gave its closing argument, I remember the, one of the last things they said was, I know that every last Anglo-Saxon one of you will have the courage to bring back a verdict of not guilty and set these men free. After a five-day trial, the jury retired to make its decision. To give the illusion of some deliberation, the 12 men paused to share a soda pop. Only 67 minutes after they left the courtroom, they returned with their decision, not guilty. When that verdict came through, 
it was uh, as if to say, it's open season on niggers. And the noise that went up, the celebration that went on was unbelievable. How do you folks feel now that it's all over? Roy, how about you? I'm just glad it's over with. J.W.? I am too. Mrs. Bryant, though. Feel fine. It was scary. It was like, here we are. This is, I'm an American. This is America. And this is a place where people can call a child out of a house and take him away. And he's never seen again until his body comes up in the river and he's dead. This was like the most dramatic illustration of the nightmare of, of what we were living with and what we had created. Two months after the trial, a journalist named William Bradford Huey paid Milam and Bryant $4,000 to tell him the real story. Because they could not be tried twice for the same crime, they agreed. In a blow-by-blow -blow description, they told Huey how they had stripped the boy, beat him, shot him in the head, tied him to the old cotton gin fan, and then thrown him in the Tallahatchie River. At first, they said they didn't plan to kill the boy, but after the way he acted toward them, they felt they had no choice. When they made this story public of how they brutalized this boy, because he would not say he was afraid of them as a white as white people, uh, that just turned us all on. It gave us new energy to get into it. So it was a stimulant, a major stimulant, in pushing people further and deeper into the civil rights movement. In Sumner, one day after the trial took place, a young reporter for NBC Radio named John Chancellor was rushed by a group of whites, furious at the way the northern media had portrayed their town. I had on my shoulder a little tape recorder, a little portable tape recorder that wasn't connected to anything but its own battery. And so what I did was I held up this little microphone and I said, you can do what you want to me, but the whole world is going to know about it if you do it. Know that before you take one more step. And they stopped. The unexpected power of the microphone and the camera would be used by sophisticated young black leaders to make the struggle for civil rights visible to the entire nation. In 1954, the Supreme Court decision of Brown versus Board of Education had declared that segregated schools were unconstitutional. To provide equal opportunity for all children, schools across the country would be forced to integrate. In 1957, Little Rock, Arkansas, in order to comply with the Supreme Court, moved to integrate its central high school. Starting slowly, the local school board chose nine African-American students for their excellent grades. When we walk in, that's when we walk out. Mm -hmm. And it's not right. They have schools just as good as ours. It will be this popular resentment did not escape the notice of Orville Faubus, the governor of Arkansas. Seeking re-election, he would find a dramatic way of courting the segregationist vote. He was not a racist. I don't think he was mo motivated by any kind of uh, animosity toward blacks. On the other hand, he was expedient. He used the race issue when it served his purpose. But equally important, and in some cases perhaps even more important, was what I always used to define as the ain't no son of a bitch gonna tell me what to do syndrome. Units of the National Guard have been and are now being mobilized with the mission to maintain or restore the peace and good order of this community. Faubus used the force of the Arkansas National Guard to prevent any black students from entering Central High School. Afraid of potential violence, the NAACP called back the black children who were supposed to attend school that day. But one girl, Elizabeth Eckford didn't have a phone. She went to school alone.
white woman intervened and managed to escort Elizabeth Eckford to a nearby bus. But TV viewers around the country had been horrified by what had happened to the young girl. President Eisenhower tried to reach a compromise with Faubus. But when Faubus called off the National Guard, he left the explosive situation in the hands of a few local police. When the students managed to sneak into school through a back entrance, the white crowd turned on a black reporter outside the school. Soviet Union, the United States promoted the justice of the American way. Now, to a watching world, American ideals seem little more than a sham. That night, President Eisenhower addressed the nation. Our enemies are gloating over this incident and using it everywhere to misrepresent our whole nation. We are portrayed as a violator of those standards of conduct with the peoples of the world united to proclaim in the Charter of the United Nations. Mob rule can not be allowed to override the decisions of our courts. Eisenhower ordered the invasion of Arkansas by units of the 101st Airborne Division. The Army had instructions to maintain order and to secure the safety of the black students while they attended school. To Orville Faubus, it was a replay of the Civil War. We are now an occupied territory. In the name of liberty we hold so dear. In the name of decency which we all cherish. What is happening in America? Eisenhower calling out the federal troops was the beginning of a real aid and assist to the modern civil rights movement because it put the federal government fairly behind the uh, desires and efforts of black citizens. The first time anybody could think of that. Somebody cared about us. Somebody cared about protecting our rights. Somebody cared about black citizens. Every day, the soldiers escorted the children to school in a convoy of jeeps mounted with machine guns. You know, this is a group of nine teenagers, and uh, we get out of this uh, station wagon. They have cleared the street. We're surrounded by a cordon of uh, soldiers with bayonets uh, drawn, marching up to the front of the steps. You, you, you had, to, you know, it was an overwhelming moment. They are in the school now. The students whom you still see still on the steps up there. there were Television had the reached its walked. mobile stage. It could take you where you could not be, which is the most important thing about television, and show you things you could not see. Everyone would get up in the morning and turn on the television. We got television now. Turn on the television and see what happened in Little Rock. The Army moved Before TV, racism had been invisible to most whites. Now, as sets across the nation tuned into the Little Rock story, Americans saw their moral scars exposed by a new group of reporters. John Chancellor of NBC News reporting from Little Rock. I must say I was very pleased to see the 101st Airborne marching down that street. I, I hated the feeling that I was taking sides but every reporter has a heart, and mine just soared. I saw not just the troopers coming down the street, I saw the Constitution of the United States coming down that street. These new reporters are not just reporters, but on a story of this moral intensity, John Chancellor and the men like him are, in fact, modern-day prophets, and he might as well be saying, as the film is rolling, 
this is a sin, this is a sin, this is a sin. The drama of Little Rock continued on throughout the year. Despite military guards in the hallways, the nine children endured insults, cruel pranks, and assaults. But by June, one senior, Ernest Green, did receive his diploma in a ceremony attended by Martin Luther King. No less a mild, entertaining figure as Louis Armstrong, the great trumpet player, made the statement, if the United States can't take care of those little children, to hell with the United States. Shocked? Louis Armstrong said that? Nice smile, Louis. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody he had been hiding himself. He had been invisible. His real self had been invisible. And suddenly he becomes visible as the real Louis Armstrong. Not only could play the trumpet, but he could be a man. Bill Russell raged against his invisibility, the skills that most people couldn't see, and the humanity they wouldn't recognize. He wanted to be seen not just as a player, but as a man. He would do these superhuman things at times during games uh, that only a, a guy that needed to win, I mean, down deep in his guts, needed to win, would do. Bill Russell was born in Monroe, Louisiana in 1934. As a young boy, he was smart and unusually sensitive to the world of the Old South. I am the black on the ball caught in your hand. At the age of nine, Russell and his family left Louisiana and became part of the great black migration to the north and to the west. The long train ride to Oakland, California, made a big impression on the young Russell, whose lifelong fondness for trains was linked to a sense of possibility stirred by his journey out of the south. In Oakland, Russell saw basketball as a way to move on up to a better life. As a senior, he impressed local scouts who offered him a scholarship at the University of San Francisco, where the team was known as the Dons. The University of San Francisco in the early 50s uh, was not a big basketball power or program. Uh, they didn't have their own gym. They were called the Homeless Dons. And uh, Russell's scholarship was uh, not a great deal. He had to wash dishes and work in the cafeteria and, and have a job while he was there. So they were not a, uh, a perennial power by any means when uh, he walked on the campus. Russell quickly adapted to college life. As a star basketball player, he was idolized on campus. It was a heady time. Then the team took their first trip down south to Louisiana. Number four on the USF team was Casey Jones. One player on the, on the team had never been south, uh, Gene Brown, raised in San Francisco. And we're having fun with this, uh, the blacks and white players. We're having fun with, uh, with, the, with the slave thing, uh, with the sit in the back, back of the bus thing. And we were laughing and joking about it. But as soon as the plane landed in uh, New Orleans, and we stepped off the plane into the lobby, all of a sudden, this, this gray cloud came down and this frown came on, uh, on the black players' faces. Uh, these signs up there, white, whites only, blacks only, this, you know, the water fountains. Gene Brown had to go to the restroom. He came back crying because he saw the signs up there. We were upset about this atmosphere of uh, you're, you're less than, than a human being. We uh, stepped on the court that night and you saw this scowl on Bill Russell's face which uh, indicated to everyone else that, okay, so this is what it's about. We uh, are going to tear this team apart. And we went out and just murdered the other team about 20, 25, 30 points.
No one had ever seen a player like Bill Russell before. He was a big man who ran. His defense was so good, it became an offensive weapon. Though his shot was gawky, he was so fast and so smart, he was still a big scorer. You remember the chief with Jack Nicholson in one floor of the cuckoo's nest, and Nicholson would station this gigantic Indian man down beneath the basket and say, Chief, catch the ball, put the ball in the basket. That's the way the game was played, and he had these behemoth guys under the basket. They weren't very mobile. Uh, it didn't matter. They were taller than everybody else and could score. Russell comes in, and a guy who was also tall, who's very mobile, very quick, and he changes their shots. Their shots are blocked all of a sudden. These guys are surprised. This man's blocking their shots. You block shots, you get the rebound, then behind that comes a fast break. And that first time we ever, I was involved in fast break was at USF. After one early loss in his junior year, Russell made sure that the Dons never lost again. They won 55 games in a row and two national championships. At the end of his senior year, Russell's extraordinary success led to speculation. What pro team would he play for? The Harlem Globetrotters cutting capers in Madison Square Garden. A little wizardry in the pre-game workout. At a time when the NBA was mostly white, a novelty team called the Harlem Globetrotters drew many of the most talented black college players. Though the Globetrotters made Russell a good offer, he wasn't sure he wanted to play the clown. Bill was insulted by the fact that the general manager of the Harlem Globetrotters chose not to speak to Russell himself. He talked to his coach, and Bill found this very insulting, and that was it. Red Auerbach, the coach of the Boston Celtics, respected Russell's intelligence. He signed him because he saw what others did not. Russell was a new kind of player for a new kind of game. At the time, the Celtics had a great ball handler named Bob Cousy. They had a good outside shooter named Tom Heinsohn. But they needed somebody to get them the ball to play defense and rebound. The missing piece was Bill Russell. complemented the skills that we had in place completely. He added a dimension to the game, shot blocking that had never been witnessed before. At six, nine and a half or whatever, he was literally as quick as a cat. And he caught everyone by surprise, the entire basketball world, the NBA, the Celtics. And as I say, the, uh, the result was uh, you know, 11 championships in 13 years. He was one of the greatest competitors, maybe the greatest competitor I ever saw play for whatever psychological reason, he needed to be the best. He would actually get physically ill before ball games. Uh, that's how important in his life playing a basketball game was. Russell would vomit before the big games, and that was the, the deal that they couldn't go out of the locker room until Bill had done his thing over in the stall. Some felt that Russell didn't really enjoy the game. For him, it was a mission, a way to release a deep rage within. I think the source of the anger is the racial issue, the uh, disrespect shown to human beings because of their color. And uh, he just has total disdain for civilization being in this mode. I mean, not respecting a person for being a human being. In cities like St. Louis, which were still segregated, where they couldn't get service in a coffee shop, and where there were a lot of racial taunts when he played, he always played his best. As it happened, the Celtics met the St. Louis Hawks for the title in Russell's first year. For Russell, it was an opportunity to prove something to St. Louis and the country. The series came down to a seventh and final game. With only a few seconds remaining, one of the Hawks streaked all alone toward the basket to win the game when Russell performed a superhuman feat. Russell went by me like I was standing still. He ran the length of the court faster than they could make one long pass and a dribble one dribble to the basket. Russell blocked the shot. 
Russell finished with 32 rebounds and five blocked shots. In the celebration afterwards, teammates shaved off Russell's goatee. He was a very rare athlete, where his stats didn't mean anything. He made his teammates better. And the teammates, I don't know what they thought of him off the floor, away from the game, but I think when they were playing the games, they all loved Bill Russell. Russell loved playing for the Celtics, but he did not like the city of Boston. At first, the only black player on the team, he felt that fans revered him as a player while they denied the humanity of ordinary African Americans. It was a northern city, but there was under, an undertow, a cultural undertow of races that he, that he must have found odious, and he kept himself apart. He acted as if he was in a foreign country, and maybe he was. In one ugly incident in Boston, thugs broke into Russell's house and scrawled the word nigger on the walls. And a lot of Boston people don't understand that this truly did happen. And he never mentioned it because he didn't want to let those people know that they had hurt him that much. We saw within our unit the complete Bill Russell. Once he stepped outside of that unit, on a plane, on a train, in a hotel lobby, he would pull the shade. Off the court, Russell refused to meet the expectations of fans and reporters. He rarely agreed to interviews, and over the years he infuriated fans by refusing to sign any autographs, ever. One day, when I asked him to sign a picture because I wanted all of the, the players that I had played with to sign an autograph, and he, uh, he refused. I didn't take that too well. So, hey, I can understand you not signing for everybody else. I said, but I'm different. You know, I'm a teammate. So. And he stuck to his guns. He just wouldn't sign. Real pain. He wouldn't sign. You know. Bill Russell believed that the autograph was not worth anything. Really what the whole encounter was, was for a person to meet another person. And he would shake their hands. And he would spend more time talking to them, but he wouldn't give them the autograph, because by giving him the autograph, the meeting was not the meeting of two people. Russell led the Celtics to 11 championships in 13 years. He had changed the game of basketball, and he had let everyone know that was not nearly enough. I think the entire generation that he belonged to was more activist. The country was paying attention. This was a great theater of integration. These men were proud. They were college educated. They were extremely articulate. Bill Russell's a very articulate man. He writes very well. Um, and they had something to say. And they were superior citizens, and they were angry. In 1963, Medgar Evers, the man who had done so much to collect the evidence in the Emmett Till case, was murdered by a white supremacist. In a demonstration in Boston, Bill Russell turned out to make a public declaration of his outrage. Later, he went down south to protest the murder of three other civil rights workers. In August, he was at the forefront of Martin Luther King's March on Washington. America was still divided into black and white worlds, but now there was a difference. Both were beginning to see each other more clearly. The invisible had become visible. My four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream. Throughout his days as player, coach, and executive, Bill Russell maintained his strict no autograph policy. But he had a change of heart in 1994. He agreed to sign autographs in Boston, charging fans $495 for his signature on a basketball. The take for four hours' work, $150,000. Now here's a look at our next episode of the...